Thanks for tuning in if you guys are here. This is The Crypto Show. We've got three of the best, Tim Draper, Kyle Samani, and Jimmy Song. They more or less need no introduction. We'll go through short introductions in a sec. My name's Matt Ward. I'm Strategic Advisor on Growth here at Coral. We're funding the businesses that VCs won't fund outside the blockchain, obviously. So I want to thank everybody for hopping on today. We were just talking. I had to start this because Kyle and Jimmy apparently have a bet going on on Ethereum and what the SEC is going to decide. So let's toss it over to you guys. They wanted to make this bet live on air. Well, I don't know if we want it to make it live on air, but yeah. Uh, uh, well, Kyle, why don't, why don't you begin? <laughs> yeah, so I, mean, I think it started off, what, a full four hours ago. Uh, maybe it was last night. Uh, and, you know, we're going to debating, will ETH be a security? ETH, Ethereum, Ether be a security? Uh, and Jimmy is inclined to believe that I think the SEC will announce enforcement action against, you know, some either issuers, maybe investors in the Ethereum ICO. I'm inclined to believe that there will not be enforcement action against issuers or investors. We're still kind of working through the details. Is it a money bet? Is it a do something embarrassing bet? If you lose, we're, we're kind of figuring that out. But uh, I, I think I think the reputational damage of uh, doing something humiliating is actually the more fun bet than you know pure money. I mean, we, we're we're all you know in this for the money, so you know that that part isn't as important to me. I uh, I think the suggestion that I liked best was you would have if if I win, you would have to wear a Bitcoin shirt, and if you win, I have to wear an Ethereum shirt. We could go as garish on the on whatever it says on the shirt as possible, but yeah, we're we're still trying to work out. Uh, the details of the vet and what the wind conditions are. I think if the SEC regulates uh, Ethereum, I think they're the ones who should be wearing the embarrassing shirts. I think they're <laughs> they're totally screwing up. Uh, they've got. I think they're going to be much better off if they use a light touch and uh, and really let these incredible technologies run. Where I think we're going to all be much better off if. Uh, if in the U.S., if the if the U.S. SEC doesn't get in the way of progress, in the way of technology, and I don't think they want to, I don't think they want to to damp down technological progress. And if they did, everybody'd move to another country. They'd go to Japan, where Bitcoin's legal, and not only legal, it's it's their national, it's one of their two national currencies. And these governments have to compete with each other for us. I think we're we're much better off um, recognizing that. And the U in the U.S., I think the SEC should recognize that they are in competition with the other SECs of the world. And the ones with the lightest touch are the ones who are going to win us over. Especially, and you never want to kick out the top dog. Right now, Ethereum, they're number one or number two. And that's why I wanted to get all you guys on here to see who's number one, who's number two. That doesn't matter as much as how do you guys look at crypto networks? How do you get involved? And we should do slight little intros. So, Tim, can you quickly can you quickly introduce yourself for people that don't know who you are? Um, I'm Tim Draper. I'm a venture capitalist with Draper Associates. I wrote a book. It's called How to Be the Startup Hero. And I have a, a a uh, school called Draper University of Heroes that has uh, that's for entrepreneurs who want to take big leaps and uh, change their life and make it make the world a better place. And then uh, uh, we have a show called Meet the Drapers, which is where we interview entrepreneurs and they uh, it's with my dad and my daughter and they uh, we we have some fun with it. They the viewers are allowed to invest in the companies through uh, the crowdfunding, uh, through a crowdfunding group called Republic. And with that, yeah, that's probably enough. Kyle? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Kyle Samani. I'm a co-founder and managing partner of a crypto hedge fund called Holy Boy Capital in Austin, Texas. We spend all of our time on tokens, crypto things. I'm pretty colorful on Twitter. I uh, like to publish a lot of writing and research and such. I think that's probably a good summary. Okay. And Jimmy. I'm Jimmy Song. I'm a Bitcoin entrepreneur, educator, and developer. I, I 
I've been in the space for about seven years now, uh, last five as a developer. And uh, I'm also a venture partner at uh, Blockchain Capital. I, I do my own uh, business uh, teaching developers how to develop on Bitcoin, uh, programming blockchain. That's, uh, that's what I do. But um, yeah, I, I do a lot of writing, a lot of tweeting, a lot of shows, a lot of speaking, uh, much like these uh, esteemed panelists, uh, my, yeah, my co-panelists, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, we got a pretty awesome panel. I'm excited. And let's face it, everyone here is interested in blockchain. You fall down the rabbit hole, but you also get excited because there's the chance of making a ton of money. So that's why a lot of the people here are on the call today. So let's talk through where is the blockchain and cryptocurrency space headed, in your opinion? Anyone take any question, interrupt, and argue. That's what we're here for. So, I mean, I think the most exciting storyline that uh, intrigues me is kind of over the next year or two is going to be the emergence of Ethereum competitors. Um, and like, we're going to have a war of smart contract platforms. I think the best kind of historical analogy is probably going to be the OS wars of the 80s, uh, where there was there was a 20 or so viable OSs that were kind of competing at the time. And it turns out kind of business development won for Microsoft. Um, but like, Ethereum has been the only game in town. There's like 20 of these things popping up. Uh, and I'm super excited to uh, like watch this battle unfold. It's going to be one for the ages. Who are you guys banking on? Is Ethereum your is Ethereum your lead, Tim, or do you like some other projects? Um, you know, it's interesting. I I'm really enjoying all of the creativity that's coming out of um, of Bitcoin and the blockchain and Ethereum and smart contracts and I. It just it opens up whole new venues. It it makes it so that we. Um, some of the biggest industries in the world are going to be transformed by these new technologies. And that's what I'm the most excited about. I'm not so much thinking, you know, trading this, trading that. I'm actually looking and saying, wow, you can use this technology to replace a bureaucrat. You can use this technology to change real estate. Uh, there, there, there's no reason anymore to, uh, to have title insurance because title will all be done on the blockchain. I love that what it's doing for, I mean, for insurance, it's going to be amazing. Uh, just you're going to, you're going to get your insurance payments right away. Your premiums are going to be taken up and you're going to get your payments immediately. Um, I think it's really amazing what's going to happen there. Electricity is going to be, um, you know, probably tied to some, Bitcoin or some other currency, there are going to be so many amazing changes because this technology has done so much. And uh, and then you said, well, what's the future? I, I made that prediction uh, a long time ago that in three years, Bitcoin would be worth 10,000. And that was when Bitcoin was at about 200. And I was right on the number. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll do another analysis and I'll come up with another calculation and and my calculation said that Bitcoin would be at 250,000 by 2022 and that may actually be a conservative prediction um, because there is I mean here's what I'm thinking I'm thinking why will in four years who's going to want to use fiat currency who's going to want some currency that's tied to the political whims of some government official or another, the central bank or whatever. I, who's who's going to want that when you can have a currency that you can take with you anywhere you go? If you're in Argentina, um, there's this guy, Sebastian Serrano, and he started uh, Ripio, the currency down there. And, uh, well, it's a global currency. They all are. And he said that my family has lost their fortune three times in my life and I'm only 30 years old. And so what he's saying is basically that their government has basically destroyed their economy three times in his lifetime. He looks at Bitcoin and he thinks this is the most stable, awesome thing ever. And if I've got Bitcoin and my government collapses again, um, I can just go to government next door or some other place and just pull down my Bitcoin and I, I still have money. Uh, this is going to, uh, boy, this is big. It's bigger than any anything that's ever happened in the history of the world. And uh, the smartest governments are going to be the, the ones that have the lightest touch. 
What's holding us uh, back from that? Well, so can I can I can I respond to that a yeah, little yeah. bit? So so I, I agree with Tim that uh, sound money or the ability to transfer value without uh, needing to physically be there or without a central party uh, that's controlling it that itself is valuable. All of the other stuff, the ICOs, the crowdfunding, blockchain technology. All that stuff, I don't find valuable at all. And I've studied this technology. I've tried to make it work. I, I, I've looked at it and the vulnerabilities are insane. You could try to have real estate on the blockchain, but the fact of the matter is, as soon as you, uh, you, you put some sort of tokenized version of some piece of land on the blockchain, you have to have some authority that recognizes that those two are the same thing. And that's a centralized party. So you, you're still going to need a bureaucrat that says, okay, well, I recognize that these two things are the same thing and you sold it to this other person and you transfer the token. Therefore, it's the same. It, it, it doesn't matter, right? Like it, it, if, the, if the bureaucrat doesn't think that you, you actually have a right to that land, they can go and roll it back or say the, the blockchain that, uh, that has it doesn't, uh, you know, isn't, isn't the matter of record. The only thing that you can actually use the blockchain for is something that's a digital bearer instrument. And most of these things, most of these... Uh, uh, these uh, applications of blockchain that people try to uh, come up with, they all have a central party. And if you already have a central party, then why the hell are you using a blockchain? A blockchain in that case is a very slow and expensive database. And it's, a, it's not something that you should be using unless you have people that are sort of in an adversarial environment. And if you do have people in an adversarial environment and you have an adjud adjudicator that's already centralized, then why, why, why the hell do you need a blockchain in the first place? So to me, it, uh, the, the entire idea that the blockchain will like transform everything or uh, uh, like change all these industries, I just don't see it. And I say that as, as a developer, as a technologist, as somebody that's looked into this and tried to make it work, you always have this central linking thing and you have a centralized party, a lot, like, like a lot of these ICOs clearly are. They, they have a centralized party that's providing some good or service for the token that's, that's being done. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. It, it, it doesn't seem like there's any innovation in that aspect. The real innovation is in sound money. It's in Bitcoin. It's in the ability to, like Tim was saying, uh, to, to be able to transact without the government being able to uh, sort of inflate away that value. Okay. So I, I think if, as you look at the world as it is today, I think Jimmy's absolutely right. But if you project out, you're... This is going to be a much faster database. The Moore's law continues on. We're going to see things happen much faster. And if a government official sees over and over that their that their their view of that piece of real estate through the surveyors and the whatever is is less accurate than the one that's coming off the blockchain, I think they're eventually going to say, well, let's just use the blockchain. I do think that there, there are many there are many things that are going to happen as as this technology continues to improve as more and more engineers work on it like Jimmy work on it it will improve. I mean I've been fortunate I've lived a long life so I've been able to see how amazing transformations happen and they happen faster than anybody imagines and it happens that way because Every new invention, every new innovation, every new engineering piece of progress is a new platform from which we we excel. Uh, and now, when there's a major breakthrough, it spreads around. The word spreads around the world faster than ever before, and so so progress happens faster and faster. And I am very optimistic that uh, that the blockchain has the capability to do this and it is more secure you're saying it's not secure the the banks are insecure we're so lucky we've got bitcoin now because the banks are are playing whack-a-mole trying to beat back the hackers and they are not able to i, I my account's been hacked my fiat currency is less secure than my bitcoin is and and that's something where as people start to recognize that, they're going to start feeling like, okay, I'm going to start pulling away. And the banks are totally under attack. And so it feels to me like we're moving in this direction and I am projecting out. I mean, 
honestly, Jimmy's right if you're looking at the world as it is today. But no, 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 no. So, as, as it can be. Well, um, so I, I, I am looking at the world as it can be. Uh, you, if you do have a government official that decides that this token is on the blockchain, represents this p particular piece of land, they're the centralized party. They're, they're ultimately the authority. And if they say, okay, well, that, that piece of land was bought with drug money, therefore we're not gonna, we're not gonna allow this transaction. Uh, the blockchain says that it belongs to the drug dealer, but we're, we're, we're just gonna ignore that. They, they have the right to do that because they're they're ultimately the one in authority. So unless you have a digital bearer instrument, none of, none of the benefits of a blockchain actually accrue to uh, to to that item. So I mean, I, I think what you were saying about like fiat currency versus sound money uh, that's Bitcoin, that that's absolutely true. I, I, I you'll get no argument from me on that. But the idea that you know somehow that's going to improve with technology that that's an intractable problem because okay. land is not a digital digital bearer instrument. Okay, I get where you're going with this. Here's the little piece that maybe um, you hadn't thought about. Maybe you have. Um, governments now are in competition with each other for us, and governments are going to have to become more efficient and more effective. And, and they can't play that I am king and you are a slave thing anymore. And Why not? They have the Chinese, <laughs> Right. The Chinese government is doing that and all the best entrepreneurs are leaving China. Chinese government used to be this free thing. All of a sudden, after Deng Xiaoping, they went for, for 40 years being a free market and a free open society. And, and it's amazing what happened. China became one of the wealthier countries of the world. And now they've got a president who is saying, no, I'm the dictator for life. You guys have to be my slaves and nobody's going to let currency leave. And so now the, the best entrepreneurs from China are going, I'm out of here. I'm going to go to Japan or I'm going to go to Japan. They say, you know, uh, Bitcoin is a, one of the national currencies. We're open. Come to us. And other countries are all competing for us. And so right, we're right. Gonna okay, but that that's a separate issue. That has nothing to do with blockchain, right? Like um, oh, if you have no. a good government, then they can they can uh, they can allow you uh, yeah, like cheaper transactions and stuff. That's an IT infrastructure. Upgrade. Okay, but I'll that has to nothing country, to do with uh, no, blockchain. I'll go to the country that says um, here's my uh, plot of land and it's on the blockchain before I go to the country that says some bureaucrat's going to decide whether I own it or not. And that is, that is what is going to happen. I mean, people will flock to the free and, and honest governments and they will leave the ones that are command and control. And the command and control countries are gonna become poor and the free governments are gonna become rich. And, and so there'll be a, a migration of all the best people. There'll be a brain drain from the countries that are, are heavily controlling. And we're going to see, and, and so the heavily controlling governments are going to have to go, okay, we've got to use the blockchain for our real estate. We've got to create a better tax system here. We've got to be more honest with our people. We've got to- I, I, I'm all for market competition and governments, but I, I don't think that's how the, this plays out. Or, I mean, you're still trusting a central party, right? You might have a dictator, that's uh, all for free markets. And then, uh, you know, his son uh, decides all of a sudden that all of the stuff on the blockchain no longer is valid and uh, we're going to socialize everything. And that's happened in many, many different countries. Oh, I all know. Throughout I know. It's a, so it's I, a, I don't see how the blockchain is relevant to this sort of like evolution of, uh, of society here. When you can see know, what everyone else thinks. It's the reason we got a disaster in North Korea. I think it's um, it, you know, it's the sons even worse than the father, and they're both they both feel like the world is supposed to do their bidding, and both of them should be overthrown. And and I think the Chinese president should be overthrown. They're they're fifteen, they're one point five billion people in China, and they're all better suited to do the job than he is. And that and it's just time they they should just say, hey, let's let's change this. You know, we may not love our president in the U.S., but at least we know that in four years or eight, he'll be out. And and we and uh, 
like Switzerland had this great opportunity because all the ICOs were being done in Switzerland. And then they got heavily bureaucratic and everybody moved their ICOs to Singapore. And then Singapore started to get heavily bureaucratic and they moved their ICOs to, to uh, uh, where are they now? Cayman and Gibraltar and Malta. All these little countries are all gonna start this revolution that kind of changes the whole nature of governance and it'll move slowly. And, and it's interesting that a big country like Japan is is so free market and so open to this new currency and new um new way of of operating so, so, i mean i keep hearing that uh you know you 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 seem to equate like icos and bitcoin in the same boat I, and i i don't think that's fair i i think bitcoin is actually revolutionary actually innovative most icos to me are scammy they're, they're raising money on nothing but a white paper. They don't have any product. Most of them have, like, I, I think Augur raised raise money two years ago. They haven't put out a product yet. They're, they're, they're not doing anything innovative. They're spending lots of money on who knows what. Uh, I, I mean, to say that those are innovations, I, I mean, to, I, I'm a libertarian and I'm all for, like, not regulating things, but I don't blame the Singapore government or you know the Chinese government or whoever it is that's uh, sort of restricting a lot of these ICOs from doing that. I don't know. Maybe maybe we should hear from Kyle. I feel I feel kind of bad. I, what what's your take on this stuff? Yeah, so I, I'm not. Gonna, I think I'll let your kind of debate on like government power and like freedom mm -hmm. of entrepreneurs. I'll let I'll let all that stuff stand. I won't really jump in there. Um, you know, it, it's my job to invest in things that are not Bitcoin because like my investors in my fund can buy Bitcoin outside of me they don't need me to do that um and like there are very clear tangible applications for the stuff um that are either live today or will be live in the next you know 30 60 90 days so very very immediate future um one kind of one of my favorite examples is, is online gambling if you look at the history of online gambling it's rife with fraud because the the, the host the casino ran the computer you know ran the random number generator on their server and there was no audit record or trail to demonstrate that you know the consumer could, was getting a fair random number, and like blockchain, without a question, is the right answer to this problem. Um, and if you look at Funfair, it's kind of a prominent team that's solving this. Um, like you might say that's not mainstream, but like dude, there are hundreds of millions of people around the world who like gambling in a casino. Um, like it's a real global market, uh, and like this is the right answer. Um, I, I look at something like Augur. It's true the Augur team has been slow to ship, uh, but like the system is, is on the verge of coming out. Engineers are notoriously not good at projecting timelines, uh, but like Augur is a revolutionary concept. Um, you know, it's the ability to have a decentralized prediction market, right? We're investing in all kinds of things like Filecoin um, and, and Golem and these distributed compute technologies. Uh, LivePeer, LivePeer just went live on mainnet a week ago. Uh, we're fortunate to be early investors in LivePeer. And LivePeer is going to enable censorship resistant, you know, video transcoding and ultimately video relaying. Um, so that when people try to get regulated by the governments in whatever country, they'll be able to get live video out of the country. Um, I mean, these are these are powerful technologies and concepts. They're still very nascent. They're still fragile. They are buggy. They kind of sort of don't work. Kind of do work. Um, but like this stuff is very clearly quite powerful. Um, I, I think it's a little bit unfair to just say, "Oh, well, Bitcoin is the only thing that's there." Well, the, big, the digital gold use case is certainly valuable. No questions asked. Um, but there's a lot of other compelling applications for this stuff. See, so, I, I don't know if they're that compelling because you can do them without a blockchain. You could do them like sort of peer to peer using some something like uh, you know uh, you know with, without needing to do all of this uh, crazy stuff on a blockchain that's really expensive. I mean, from a techno technological standpoint, a blockchain is extremely expensive, right? Like you have to store all the data, you have to transmit all the data, you have to verify all the data. And not, not only that, but you have to like sort of keep track of everything and every single node that, that's on the network has to do all of that. If you have a centralized service, you, you only have to do it once. With, with a thousand nodes on the network, you have to do it a thousand times. And you don't, uh, you know, with a centralized service, you don't, you don't have to verify everything every single time. You don't have to transmit to a thousand different nodes. Um, so in a, in a sense, uh, it, th this seems like a solution looking for a problem. And the only, only one that it's, it's proven to solve is Bitcoin. And all of these other sort of use cases like decentralize this or de decentralize that, you're absolutely right that they haven't 
actually proven themselves in any way, shape or form. Most of them are concepts and people fall in love with the concepts without actually looking into the tech and saying, okay, well, oh, oh yeah, that, that doesn't work. Storage has been around since like 2013 or something like that. 2014 maybe they've been going for four years about uh you know doing something like a decentralized dropbox so that they can uh you know people can store files on somebody else's thing this is kind of like what filecoin is about a lot of these places seem to think that having some sort of decentralization around uh storing it on somebody else's computer is actually a good thing or something i have not seen anyone that's demanding that kind of technology nobody actually wants it you know, like uh, if I want to store data, I can get a thumb drive for five, you know, twenty dollars that will do like way better than a token that's like, uh, you know, five hundred dollars or something. Uh, it, it, it just doesn't really make any sense to me. And the price prices and all that stuff don't make any sense to me. For, for me, most of the value of all of these coins are not on the technology itself. It's all speculation value. It's a Keynesian beauty contest as far as I'm concerned. It is. Let me summarize. Oh, it's so interesting. I think you guys are, are both right in some ways. Um, Jimmy, again, I think you're looking at it as it is today. But, you know, the, the Internet was kind of this interesting thing that nobody really used for much. But and, and people sort of said, well, yeah, the only thing it's going to be good for is uh, search. And then all of a sudden there were all these other technologies that came out of that. And. Um, I, sure, I don't think sure, that's true. I don't think that's true. I, I think if you look at the history of the internet, it started with a lot of people that were communicating via email and things like that. It wasn't. It wasn't that like Jimmy, there, there were very early cases that were very obvious uh, where where people were using it. With ICOs, you have no idea. Like that, it's 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 kind of a broken funding model as far as I'm concerned. No, I, I think you're missing the whole point. Is that the blockchain has opened up people's minds and suddenly you have all this creativity of 7 billion people on the planet who are saying, hey, this is interesting and it can be used for other things. And Bitcoin's opened their eyes too. Bitcoin has made it so people have said, wow, this is interesting. This is a new currency. I can, it's global, it's decentralized, it's safe, it's more secure than what's out there. That's a big breakthrough. People are saying, hey, we can use it for remittance. We can use it for whatever, you know, storing value for all the many, many things that they're using it for. But you're going to start seeing um, other new ICOs, new technologies that are doing equally interesting things. And uh, and it is true, by the way, that it people all did say the sort of same stuff about the Internet, that this is not good for anything but kitty porn or whatever and uh and all of a sudden there were these all these creative people that came up with all these creative ideas and now you know it used to be back then we only had maybe a hundred thousand people who were capable of chiming in and coming up with creative new solutions for for uh businesses now pretty much maybe half the population of the earth, maybe three to four billion people have access and can put their creativity on this. And I think we're going to see amazing things happen. So much, it, so much can happen. And of course, yeah, it's not there yet. And I understand the engineer in you saying, yeah, it's, but engineers can do stuff. They can create new stuff. They can, and, and, and it's their imagination that we're all counting on. I, I describe an ICO as a Kickstarter for societal transformation. It's, yeah, some of them are just these little fluff deals and people just taking advantage of it, trying to make quick bucks. And, uh, and I'm, I'm wondering who the people are who are backing them. I, I, I think that that's, you know, it's a big mistake to back them, but, but if you've got a if you've got an ICO, you can design that in any way you want, and um, and the reason I say it's like a Kickstarter, it's like the product's not made yet, but if you want this societal transformation, you'll buy my coin, and I think that's what people are saying, and I think that's the beginning of what could be an amazing transformation of the earth. 
Well, I, I, I completely disagree because uh, the only creativity I've seen is in how they market these ICOs and uh, try to sell to very gullible people that want asymmetric payoffs, as far as I'm, I'm concerned. A, a, a lot, I've, I've well, worked on a lot of proof these. Of stake. Proof of stake has shown up. Yeah, I, I think proof of stake is, is ridiculous. I think I, I don't think it secures anything. It's a uh, it, it's a uh, it's a way to um, sort of like give the control of the central database to to a bunch of people, and uh, that can be manipulated. As soon as you add adversarial thinking to proof of stake, it doesn't doesn't work. Um, but the the whole idea that ICOs are some some sort of revolutionary civilized thing, I, I think, is completely misguided because. Most of the time, these people are not creating anything. ICOs are not new. They started in 2013 with MasterCoin. You know where that project is? They, they were, they, their name was so in the mud. Nobody liked them at all that they had to change their name to Omni. And they haven't done anything. The, the thing that Omni is famous for is that it's the platform on which Tether is built. And there are all sorts of questions about Tether and whether or not that's actually solvent. But the, I, the, the whole point of ICOs is to raise money, like you said, to do a Kickstarter. Um, you can't change your business model afterwards. You're sort of, uh, sort of locked in. It's, a, it's, it's dead simple to create an ERC-20 token. It's literally fill in the blanks on a template uh, 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 of a bunch of Solidity code. You just like add your name to it and change a few addresses and stuff like that. It's dead simple. It, it doesn't require any creativity whatsoever. And most of the time, people are selling snake oil. They're, they're not selling anything that's built. They're, they're saying, we're going to build it. I mean, they, it's kind of like trusting a politician to keep their promises. It doesn't happen. And mo most of the time, they're, they're more interested in the money or the power, not at all in the technology or the societal transformation. If they actually were, then they would build the thing first and then go and ask for investors. That's the way normal things work. This is how scams work is that you collect the money first and promise to build it later. You live in a dark world. <laughs> I, you know, I think uh, it must be very str strange for you. You must think that you're a, in a tunnel that will never get light. But No, I, I, but I, I'm I, very optimistic. I, mean, I, I, mean, don't, I, I, I haven't seen through, anything out of my ICOs. Through, I mean, there's, there are tons of new technologies that have come out from the ICOs and a lot of using the existing technology in new ways. All of that really does help. It moves people along. Smart contracts. That's a that's something that's not that existed there. in Bitcoin starting in two thousand nine. Uh, the the idea right. that smart contracts right. are new in uh, new in Ethereum you know, is an idiotic statement because they did you know, it. The only thing that a, they did was make it more vulnerable. There was a um, there was a patent office. The guy who ran the patent office in nineteen oh nine, and he said everything that has been in any everything that will be invented has already been invented that's the way it sounds like you are you're thinking no, no, it's no, all I'm not, I'm not saying it, right? in 2009 and it's all over and, no 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 and i'm not saying that at all i looked at the technology gonna, none Tim, of these seven billion Tim, people Tim, are Tim, 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 anything new the technology i've looked at it I've, i i i i get i get asked I'm to look at it all the time here jimmy I'm having a lot of fun because I'm thinking this is just hilarious that you think that the world has basically ended when Bitcoin was invented. I never and said I that. I never that said that. Happened. I'm saying that the ICOs are not adding anything Let new. Let me take over for a sec. So I think what I'm seeing the difference being is it looks like for blockchain to get or reach its potential, it has to disrupt large players, i.e. governments, i.e. large businesses. So for this to make any sense whatsoever, you're moving towards the world where you have one government or a non-government, i.e. the world where you were interpl interplanetary. You have to get to the point where you have one government and you're more efficiently using resources. Is it fair to say for blockchain to be successful, we need to have severe revolution and possibly civil disrespect? Well, it's possible <laughs> like, that's coming. Like, Matt, I, I, think, I think it's looking at this in such a binary lens is not not helpful um it, it's uh, so i've said this publicly and I'll, I'll say it again i think in the next five years you will see crypto challenge the legitimacy of some governments like libya and argentina venezuela one, one of those uh, i think a lot of people think that's 10 20 30 years out i think i think that's a lot sooner than people think um i think when there's a credible global alternative to uh, a fiat uh and then you get you hit that crisis point in whatever the country is I think you'll you'll start to see uh, you know mass crypto adoption for consumer retail uh, much sooner than people think. 
and that will really screw with the government in a pretty profound way. And I think that's not more than a few years away. Um, but like that's a one country at a thing time. And then also like Western democracies, Japan, China, right? Like these states, like suggesting that crypto is going to challenge the legitimacy of these states. I mean, you can like make some very you know like long out there projections and like maybe it's possible on some time scale, but you really can't project that with any sense of confidence interval of timing um, there. I, I think that's a little bit ludicrous, but um, the weak governments that don't serve their people, like they will be challenged and they will probably lose. We talked about yeah. blockchain replacing bureaucrat. A bureaucrat. Now, now, but you you said that it all had to be done in one, with one government. I think that's completely wrong. I think what's great about this and what's great about ICOs is there are now competitive virtual governments out there. They will all compete for us and they will provide better service. If whenever it gets centralized, you have a monopoly and and uh, you know, then then you get corruption. If if you have a competitive force, which we do in cryptocurrency, uh, then the world ends up a lot better. Yeah, I, I agree that the world end up, ends up a lot better with sound money. Bitcoin uh, so far is the only application of blockchain that makes any sense or is utilized to any degree, as far as I can tell. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I disagree with this assertion that I, I've been doing startups all my life, Tim. I, I, don't, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's unfair for you to say, say to me that I, I think that all innovation has already occurred. I've been doing this since like 98 when I first came out of college. I've been doing startups ever since then. And I've, I've been a part of a lot of really good ones, uh, several that have IPO'd and things like that. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is I know good innovation when I see it. Bitcoin is an, actually an innovation. ICOs are not. They, uh, they feel like, uh, I mean, they feel like the segue to me. People think it's gonna, they, they imagine all of the possible use cases and think it's gonna be much more useful than it is. Really, it's only for mall cops and uh, tours of cities at this point. It's, a, it's, a, it's not this like world-changing technology that people seem to think it is. And if you've actually studied that, uh, you know, what a blockchain is, it's really like it ends up being a very expensive thing that you can't really use. And a lot of these ICOs that are, that are going along, just from a very practical business perspective, you're funding things before they made anything. And it, do it doesn't make any sense. Uh, none of them have released any products. And you know, I, I'm open. I'm totally open to being wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm open to being wrong. If somebody comes up with a product that a lot of mass that gets mass consumer adoption, and not just from token holders, I will eat my words. I I, I am happy to do that. But uh, I have not seen it. I've been watching this space very closely for seven years, and I have here's not one. seen a single project come to fruition. Here's like one that. Ethereum. Here's one. No, Numerare. Numerare. Every single What's week. Thousands and thousands of data scientists every single week stake numerator tokens to compete in data science competitions to drive a, a, fun, a kind of a revolution. Wait, wait, they're staking staking tokens, so they're they're uh, putting locking up their tokens to get a chance for more. Is that right? They, well, they're also data scientists, and they're producing like data science models and competing in a in a, in a competition. Well, I, a, I haven't heard of it, but I'm, I, I'm happy to take a look. As far as I can tell, that's uh, you know, I mean, that's my my, my, my I, I don't know judges who. who who wins that data science competition, but I imagine that's a centralized party and can be done much better centrally. It, it's a business and they run a hedge fund. They distribute their funds into the stocks that the best models pick. So then the parts of the winnings are put back to the data scientists. It's all distributed in terms of all of the data science. I, I mean, the, the point is like, I, I see the word blockchain a lot and 90% of the time it's some sort of uh, buzzword, buzzword bingo that a lot of like VCs and hedge fund players are, or businesses are playing saying, okay, well, I now have the blockchain because I'm using this very expensive database. No, you're not. 90% of the time, uh, what they're doing is they have a centralized database that's replicated and they pretend that it's a blockchain for some reason. And what uh, that's what most of these projects are doing. So to most, me, it's uh, not games. anything innovative. Yeah. But, but Jimmy, what about the other 10%? Like, yeah, huh? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, I mean, the, the other 10% have products that don't work at all. So I mean, that's 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 what I've observed. So I don't know. I like you guys, you guys may disagree, but I, I've been observing this space for a long time. I haven't seen anything. Uh, and maybe you guys are funding something that I, that should be brought to my attention, but I have not seen 
anyone outside of crypto say you really need to use this project product it uses the blockchain and uh and you know like uh it, it lets you do this cool thing that you couldn't do before did you use not a single case? person not a single you know, person think, has i think you're that. i think you're right that uh venture capitalists are talking about blockchain like it's this thing that that's very important to them and they don't they don't realize how long it's going to be before everybody does start businesses really do start using the blockchain to secure their and and uh, verify their data but there are going to be a lot of interesting uses of it and i believe that it will speed up and um you know if you just run moore's law uh it will be an insignificant cost in three years so uh what, what so, would be an insignificant cost the database cost or storage cost yeah the extra cost of using a of using the blockchain for to secure your database that, okay that will in three years it won't be big it's going to well, be well, fair enough but i it won't be yeah, and it'll be much faster it'll be something so, else so i think we're going to be in a really interesting time in about three years where where all data does go on the blockchain and yeah the, 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 the predictions that i make they they could be five years out they could be 15 years out but i do know that I, i'm watching those curves and i'm seeing where they start to cross and uh and and there is going to be a real use for the these technologies and as a technologist you might say yeah but there's nothing new there well that's possible but the application of that technology uh into different industries is new and just as the internet transformed you know music and then it transformed communications and information and gaming and eventually taxis and hotels same thing's going to happen here with this new technology you're going to see changes in real estate you're going to see changes in uh insurance changes in healthcare, changes in government and these are huge huge industries so yeah maybe maybe the fundamental thing has happened and that that we need to now replicate we need we need to move that into all these industries and that's where all the creativity is going um and and I think so. I think as a technologist, you look and you say, "Well, look, this was a major breakthrough. None of these are major breakthroughs. That is probably true, but they are as they're applied to different industries. That is a breakthrough, and it does have a big effect." Okay. All right. So this is something that I will say is that uh, I I I get how you're thinking, right? Like you can take this from over here and bring it over here and get a lot more efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. And I've studied this very, very closely. And I, I say this, um, you know, having studied it, you can't replicate what you got in Bitcoin, that blockchain technology into something like healthcare. And I'll tell you several reasons why. Number one, first, you have a company that needs to make money off of making this technology available. That naturally makes them a centralized party. And this you is the problem with a lot of people. What? Did you get paid when you developed for Bitcoin? and open source technology? No. So how did you make your money? Well, no, I mean, I, I, I worked for companies that were working on top of it, right? So I, I, I made, a, I, I was VP of engineering at Armory. So I, we, we made a wallet and so they, they paid me. We had funding and we were trying to do some enterprise stuff. It turned out like third party custodial solutions were like two or three years too early. Like that, right. that, that would be also, really good tech now. Wait, didn't you also make money on the Bitcoin? Yeah, of course. I, I bought some and right. that, that's so gone that's up in value. So that's what's going to happen is that people will make money by by creating more uses for Bitcoin or other currencies. Okay. All right. So but so let let me go back back to my original point, which is that w Bitcoin is decentralized. As soon as you have a central party that sort of like uh, puts out the software or creates the stuff or creates the tokens or whatever, they're the central party. And at that point, it makes no sense to have replicated databases all over the place because it's already verifiable to the degree that you can with signatures etc but the fact of the matter is if you have uh, the, like distributing it all over the place is a cost without any benefit when you're a centralized system 
Really, like you could yes. you could do AWS backups, uh, like and, and get the same exact thing. You can get timestamps well, through Verisign, all, all okay, sorts well, of other where, ways. This is where a lot of those ICO groups are creating a coin, and it's decentralized. And it's not decentralized. They're the ones issuing it. That's that's a centralized party. It's not decentralized. No, it's decentralized because it's it's operates the same way as all the other coins out no there. no you have a centralized party that's that decentralized no, they, means that you don't have a single dissolve, point of failure many of them just dissolve their their corporate entity and they just allow the coins to proliferate and that's all that's the only way they make money is on the appreciation of their coins and that the, and those coins they, they issued it some you have to be able growth. to redeem it and and whoever re, they can refuse to redeem it they get i mean the all coins, uh, especially I most see, all coins, especially are, it's still controlled by people. No, it's controlled by what? It's controlled what by that? one entity. Not no, but that? once it's no, but once it's uh, it's as I understand it, once it's handed out into the world, um, then it's open source, and anyone can add to it and pull from no, it. No, no. I mean, I mean, take a look at Tether. They they had some hack at Bitfinex, so they decided, okay, these addresses that have well, yeah. Well, they, what, these addresses that had four, you know, this amount of tether in them, uh, we're just going to ban them from making any of any transactions ever, and they they could do that. Jimmy, what is Dash in a decentralized autonomous organization? Let's let's shift over to that a little bit and what the future could look like. A, a DAO, you mean? Uh, D, yeah, DAO. DAO. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, I, the the idea is that it's supposed to be this corporation that's decentralized, but I haven't seen a single one that's actually decentralized. What what we're talking about are are centralized entities that are that that like the reputation of being decentralized and are willing to pay for that with uh, with these enormous databases that don't add any actual security and saying, okay, well, you know, that we have blockchain, therefore you should fund us or something like that. And uh, and and fool people into giving them money for the, like as an engineer, you look at this stuff. You're not gaining anything by adding a blockchain for 90, 99 percent of these uh, the, these projects. And and they're 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 just saying, OK, you know what? What we're, we're just going to uh, create this thing and have a very expensive database. I even like, uh, you know, you look at something like Crypto Kitties, right? It's uh, it's you, you, you supposedly own a Crypto Kitty. They could refuse to show the crypto kitty at any time in their part of the UI, and uh, you, there's a, you you can have right. the token on the you know, blockchain, but there's you know, no actual. I think you're getting at something. I think you're getting at something really interesting. Um, but what's great about a free market is that the free market will help determine all this. So if you lose your crypto kitty because they shut it down, you move your you go get a crypto doggy somewhere else or a crypto lizard because because you don't believe in that group anymore because they've done that bad thing if they've done a bad thing they go out of business their their currency goes out of business there uh because yeah, the world I, I totally agree with that I, well, I i think i think that's totally right but that doesn't that 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 means it's centralized right if they can right, do right. that no, it means that it, it means that they, right, that is exactly true. That means that there are people making those decisions. In some cases, though, when they say, okay, I'm leaving it up to the, to the, uh, the open source, doesn't that just, like, I, here's my coin, I'm dropping out, I'm not doing anything else, and I'm leaving, out, leaving it up to the open source, which a lot of people have done. That is decentralized, right? Nobody can make a decision. I, I don't. I don't well, I, what, can you give me an example, a solid example of what you mean by like they dropped Satoshi? out and they're no longer doing something? Like Satoshi? Like, I sort of <laughs> feel like the, those are the orphans. <laughs> uh, no, no, but, but actually, Jim, Jimmy and Tim, you're both quite quite incorrect about Crypto Kitties, and, and not that I like on that particular example. So the Crypto Kitties, the uh, the application that renders them is open source, and in fact, there are already multiple teams. That have forked the open source code that powers CryptoKitties and have created the competitive websites. Um, the, the well, people, you know, I, I, that's that's fine. But what you can do is it, every, every time you transfer a CryptoKitty, you have to call back to the original contract, right? Like the original CryptoKitties contract, in Correct. order to pay that. And that that you have to pay gas to go get that, and then like it can be transferred or whatever. 
they can shut that contract down, right? You don't, I mean, like they could they could do all sorts of things no. to that contract and say, no, um, wait a say second. whatever, they're, they're, they're all sorts of centralized, centralizing right. things. And plus it's built on Ethereum. Ethereum has a history of like bailing out or changing the ledger to whatever the hell they want. You 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 have no guarantee that your your application even gets to stay on there. So I aren't there the, all sorts aren't of the, things like isn't there a check on that with the miners? Like if the if the miners are all deciding, you know, they're verifying your crypto kitty. Mm -hmm. And your crypto kitty is one crypto kitty, and they're verifying that that is the case. There isn't any centralized source. That can shut that down because the miners. Well, are they, they all have to go back to the original contract. That that contract uh, and can be written by whoever, and it's uh, obviously written by the Crypto Kitties people. And uh, you have to call back to that contract in order to uh, get permission, basically, to go and uh, and and do it. And most of the time, that that contract has like the ownership records. It's like the registry or whatever. And uh, and you know they they can change that however the, uh, the way they want and it's uh, it's but they can't it, change it because the, they're all the miners are watching over that right no 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 they that as long as it's legal in the contract they the miners don't care and they they have no incentive to care they don't know about the details of what crypto kitties worth what or like whether or not it was a fair trade or stolen or whatever that's so that's not how it works over if some crypto kitty moves from one place to another they're going to watch over that. No, they're they're not watching. They just they just process the transaction. That's right. it. Right, but but they're going to only process the transaction if it's a legitimate transaction. If it's legal, it could it could just as easily be stolen or like as you know the crypto kitties creator could do something. It's essential. The point here is it's a centralized system, and it, at multiple levels, not just uh, at, at the crypto kitties contract level. But at the at the Ethereum level, where you know they have a history of changing whatever contracts to whatever the the ledger or the state of stuff to whatever the hell they want. So it, it, in a sense, it's it's like they, these benefits of decentralization that you guys seem to be thinking that blockchain provides doesn't actually provide it as soon as you have any centralized party. So there's no real reason to do it other than marketing or buzzword bingo or like. Executives you know, getting to say saying, we're using blockchain, and, and you're saying uh, Bitcoin does have decentralization. Uh, yes, decentralization, and no people can go in there and do anything with it. No, no, nobody can like go and change the ledger to whatever the hell they want. That's that's certainly not something that they can do. But a lot of these ICOs, that's that's exactly what they 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 can do, and oftentimes they do. That's that's why they get like a. A huge founders reward or whatever, and uh, and they're they're allowed to change the ledger and say, okay, we we now own you know thirty percent of whatever this thing is or or whatever, and we get the benefits of this or we get the benefits of that. That that's how these things are set up so that it's a centralized party. And well, shouldn't, and, and they, it, shouldn't they be getting? Well, it's not really centralized, but shouldn't they get the benefit of doing? The work shouldn't they get some extra coin for doing the work? I, I'm not going to uh, speculate on the moral question here of no, who but, should but get what, but, but I mean, the fact of the matter is, it's still centralized. I'm and not that, sure that's, that's true. Hey. I'm not sure that's true because I, I think mean, that I mean, if you look at the kind. You, okay, every transfer of a crypto kitty has to go through the crypto kitty's contract. Do you agree that's a central, central, central contract? I mean, there's a contract on the blockchain, Jimmy. I'm not sure if the CryptoKitties contract has a backdoor in it or not. I haven't looked at that specifically. But if there's no backdoor in the contract, then the contract is there, and you're not taking it down. Like, right, but but it's still well. I mean, you you don't you don't necessarily. I, I, maybe there is a backdoor where they can shut it down. I don't know. I haven't studied that contract either. But it's entirely possible that Ethereum says, "Oh, you know what? Our blockchain is growing way too fast. We're going to shut down Crypto Kitties because it's it's taking up ninety percent. So we're going to cancel this contract, and any transactions that go through it is no longer available." That's a centralization point. How much consensus there, is there's needed centralization to make that Centralization at multiple levels, and that, that that's that's uh, and the benefits, the supposed benefits of any sort of blockchain go away as soon as you have a centralized party because yeah, the, yeah. the uh, what. Uh, how many people control the Bitcoin Core repo on GitHub? I think it's about five, maybe six. No, there are four maintainers, but there's lots of contributors, and they don't all agree. So, right, but there's four people who control the release schedule of Bitcoin Core. So, so my point is, is you're 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 presenting decentralization in a very binary sense, 
And my only point of that is not to say, ha ha ha, Bitcoin is centralized, but rather to make it much more clear that like this stuff is, is gray. Like there are in all of these systems, people who control, um, you know, the, the basically the repos, right? To kind of update the code and stuff. And well, I mean, Bitcoin core is not the only implementation. Um, there's like multiple implementations and, you know, I mean, if, if you don't like Bitcoin Core, you could run BTCD, you can run Bitcoin, you can run, uh, what's that, Lib Bitcoin or whatever. There, there's like multiple implementations that you can run and they 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 can have different softworks or whatever. The, the point is that it's all voluntary and you don't have to run the latest Bitcoin Core if you don't want to. You can run 0.7 and it still will run on the network. And that's the same it's as fine. You know, I think you're, yeah, I think you're being very uh, binary on this decentralized versus centralized. Because I think we're going to, um, in general, these things are much more decentralized than they were before. And a lot what do you mean less by that? centralized than they were before. When it was under, like, you know, where... Facebook's under Zuckerberg's control, but it, it's really under the control of all of its customers. And so that's sort of decentralized. Well, I think, you think this Facebook is, is more decentralized because I think it's even more decentralized than that because you have the customers, but you also have all of the different developers who can each add to it. Tim, then, I have a question for, oh, go ahead. I have a, I have a very important question to point out, Tim. Anti-portfolio, what companies have you looked at in the past and missed? Just completely not realized that these were going to be ridiculous companies. Well, I totally blew it on Netflix because he came to me and he, he said, um, I, I said, well, in two years, these guys are going to be streaming. So why do we want DVDs going in the mail to everybody's house? Why not wait a little while and then ship this thing? And he said, well, the people aren't ready for it yet. And so I was, I was just totally off on that. Um, I was also off on LinkedIn. I, um, I thought that the people who everybody wanted to reach were, were going to not want to be on LinkedIn and all the people who, um, who wanted to reach them would be on LinkedIn. And I didn't realize how incredibly that incredible that network work effect would be. And then I was outbid uh, for both uh, Yahoo and Facebook. And uh, so my anti-portfolio is quite an extraordinary portfolio. How long have you been a VC? You're pretty good at this. 30 years, 30 plus. 30 so even if you've been in it for 30 years, you can still miss what's coming. Oh, absolutely. I, can, I, okay. I miss things all the time. Although this technology reminds me very much of the internet. That's not yeah, yeah. that's not a point that's not a point at you. That's a point at even when you're in the weeds, even when you're the best of the best, you still miss it because that's the reason that things get disrupted. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So let's um, and and it's great because uh, yeah, anybody can. I mean, we can argue until we're blue in the face, and somebody else will come up with some strange new thing that changes everything. And and we'll be you know we'll be talking about Bitcoin and the blockchain, and then somebody else will come out and with something entirely new, and and it'll completely change everything. I didn't we didn't back uh, Google either because it was the twenty sixth search engine we had seen, and we had already backed six of them. And the Somebody's got already. some kids. The yeah. problem always comes down to either you don't see what's coming or there's so much of it that you think it's nothing. And yet somehow they still change the world. That's the point I wanted to make for anyone who is skeptical is you can't really ever know. So Kyle, I want to talk a little bit more about network valuations now. That was the that was the topic of the talk so far, or that was the idea. So talk to me. How do you look at different crypto networks? How do you come up with valuations? Um, so there's a few different kinds of, of types of cryptocurrencies or crypto assets. Um, the ones that aim to be general purpose currencies tend to be things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Monero, Bitcoin Cash, uh, these things. Um, those, there's not really a good valuation model um, for them. The bet on all of those is basically call option on either digital gold or call option on global digital cash and kind of assessing probabilities of that becoming true. Um, there's not a particularly good kind of concrete valuation model for those. But if you look at other assets, so like Factum, like Augur, um, those types of assets, these, some of these specific utility tokens that have very specific models, uh, Keep uh, is another great example. In, in these systems, uh, there's actually, you can basically produce either a DCF or look at 
very specific kind of supply uh, mint and burn mechanics to derive a, a rather objective valuation uh, for these things. Um, so, you know, when we look at when we're thinking about investing, if we're looking at something where we can produce a, a discounted capital valuation model, we will assess the you know investment and the price and everything against that um, in some kind of projected state and discount back for kind of risk and such. Um, but on the other hand, if we're looking at something like Bitcoin or Monero or, or Ether or some other smart contract platform, um, then we're more looking at like, well, what's the probability that this thing could become uh, you know, digital money or digital gold uh, and then kind of assess the, basically the probability of that call option. How do you come up with those probabilities or those um, discounted cash flows? I mean, so the probabilities are, are very gray and like very subjective. Um, given how early these things are right now, we're spreading our bets across more and more smart contract platforms. I can tell you today, we will back any team building a smart contract platform that is technically credible enough to do so, which is admittedly quite few, uh, and that can fund them, articulate um, very clearly uh, why they believe the set of trade-offs they're making in designing their system, like why that set of trade-offs is the right set of trade-offs. Uh, I claim not to have any slight clue what the right set of trade-offs is or will be. Um, I, I will back any team that, that has a clear vision for, for what those are, um, knowing that as the market evolves, eventually, right now we're seeing divergence and eventually we will see convergence. Um, and so I aim to narrow my bets over time, uh, but right now we're very much spreading our bets as more um, legitimate players come, come to the table. And how do you two guys look at it? Sorry, well, what was the question? I, I, here's the way I look at it. Um, I, I think that the, there's an asymptote um, on these cryptocurrencies on how you might value them um, at $86 trillion, which is the, the total size of all fiat currencies today. And it'll probably, we are probably growing that market. There will probably be maybe $140 trillion of cryptocurrency when all is said and done. So, um, so there's a big opportunity for, uh, for all of these currencies to grow and become uh, a big part of our world. And even if they only get to uh, ha half the market share, my guess is there'll be 80% of the market share, but even if they only get to half the market share, that's $70 trillion. And right now all the cryptocurrencies in the world are worth about 300 billion. And the ones that are the most valuable are the ones that have the best um, network. Uh, and it's a little bit of, I'm testing this, but it's a little bit of Metcalf's law. As more wallets are added, uh, the network gets bigger and the value goes up by the square of that size of that network. And, and we've got a long way to go uh, because I think there are only 50 million wallets out there, Bitcoin wallets. And I think there's, uh, you know, the potential to have 8 billion of them. Uh, so that I think it's just going to continue to grow as that network continues to grow. And the asymptote, the, the, the sky, the top line is probably about $70 trillion. How do you weigh the, the number of wallets versus the, the number of fake accounts, multiple accounts, and then just fraudulent moving money back and forth to make it look like exchanges have something going on. You know, that sort of thing is usually a, a really small portion of the population. And long term, they, uh, there will be other wallets created by corporates. And I think that's going to be a big number. And, uh, and so, yeah, arguably, that would, uh, that it would sort of double the or not, not quite double, it would add maybe 30% to the number of wallet, the, it would inflate the number by about 30%. But still, I think Metcalf's law will apply and it'll uh, be that squared, that number squared times some, some constant. And so I think we got a long way to go. Very exciting and boy, a lot of people are talking about it. And if you don't have a, a wallet a Bitcoin wallet, you should, because you can't trust your government totally implicitly not to uh, not to take your money from you. We're inflated away. And guys, I want to remind everyone that this is brought to you guys by Coral. If you go to coral.io, you can learn a little bit more about us. We're funding the 99% of companies that VCs won't touch. 
the ones where you're building a business that matters, but it's not a billion dollar opportunity. Jumping back to this, I want to talk about the different types of crypto assets now. Security hey tokens. Guys, I, I have to get off, but Jimmy and Kyle, this is fabulous. So much fun. Just terrific. And Carl, great job of moderating this panel. Fun, fun to be on it. You guys, Are you going to be at consensus, Tim? No, I'm going to miss it. I, okay. I, I think I am. Yeah, they, they asked me to speak, and I was thinking, God, this is a big opportunity, great fun. Uh, but I've got a lot of other weird commitments, and I think I'm not going to be able to make it. But go, go give them hell out there. <laughs> awesome. Thanks See for tuning you. in. Where's the best place for people to connect with you, Tim? Oh, uh, Tim at Draper.vc. Uh, email's the best way. All of the other uses we really, I, email is m like my to-do list. So if you really want to connect with me, that's probably the best way to go. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. And then uh, Kyle and Jimmy, we can decide you guys want to stay on or are you guys needing to run? Uh, I'm going to be going here pretty soon. Yeah, I, I, got, I got like 10 minutes or so. Okay, one last question then. What are you guys most excited about today? Uh, today, like just in general, today, <laughs> today in the relatively immediate future. It doesn't have to be today, like your kid's birthday. I, I, I mean, the the biggest innovation that I've seen in this space, and the thing that I've been most excited about the entire time, is Bitcoin. And that's because it's sound money. I believe it to be the base layer of civilization. And right now, the base layer of civilization, if you sort of look at it as a tech stack, uh, it's kind of like our civilization is built on like Microsoft Windows or something. Um, and we're going to get an upgrade to like free BSD or something a lot more stable. Um, so I, I, I'm very excited about that and what that holds for the future. And that's, uh, that, that's what's brought me into this space. That's what keeps me going. A lot of this other stuff, I, I feel like, is noise, and uh, and you know, I mean, it'll be there, of course, but uh, it's it's not something that really gets me as excited. Okay. Uh, so I'll say, so um, the thing that excites me most about crypto, uh, specifically, is innovation at the consensus layer. Uh, Bitcoin was a, a pretty profound revolution in distributed consensus. That concept, you know, did not exist before um, in a meaningful way. And you know, Bitcoin the proof of work has been, been great. It's powered Bitcoin. Bitcoin's worth a lot of money. Um, all good things. Uh, but like, there's so much innovation happening at the consensus layer right now. Uh, various forms of proof of stake, various forms of proof of stake space time, uh, and other kind of interesting kind of derivatives of those. And the more I study these other consensus models, the more I'm fascinated by them. Uh, and I think there's massive opportunity to. Are the most interesting tech layer in these systems, uh, and we're placing very aggressive bets across all kinds of um, novel consensus algorithms, and I'm um, excited to see those play out. Awesome, and one last thing, transparency. What are you guys invested in currently, both of you, just so that we got the transparency thing out of the way? Forgot to ask him. And remember, guys, none of this is investment advice, not soliciting, not any type of legal advisor, yada, yada. Do your own due diligence. I mean, like... I'm not really in a position to disclose our portfolio. I can tell you today, I think the things that we are invested in, I, I mentioned those by name. We are invested in Bitcoin and Ethereum, if that, you know, in Bitcoin Cash, I mentioned that. Uh, beyond those, I don't think um, it's prudent to I, I think he's asking what you personally hold, not necessarily yeah, what your portfolio yeah. holds. My entire crypto is in my fund. So I own, I own nice. crypto outside of that. Okay. Um, I, I own Bitcoin. I own... Uh, some Bitcoin cash that I'm still trying to sell. Um, I own a little bit of Decred. Um, I'm an advisor for uh, for them, so that's that's part. Of, that's a large reason why. Um, and I think I might have some Ethereum. Uh, they gave me some for like Crypto All Stars or something. I don't know. It's it's, it's sitting there somewhere. So that that's about it. And I have Bitcoin, Ethereum, a little bit of Monero, just in case. And uh, I think that's it. But uh, yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. Hopefully this has been incredibly helpful. Where's the best place for people to connect with both of you? Uh, yeah, best place to connect with me is on Twitter. Um, my Twitter handle is my name, at Kyle Samani, K-Y-L-E-S-A-M-A-N-I. 
And uh, my Twitter is Jimmy Song. Um, I have a course that I give for developers to understand Bitcoin at a very fundamental level, uh, Programming Blockchain. You can go to programmingblockchain.com if you're interested. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's about it, I guess. You guys are both lucky when you're Matt Ward, everyone has that name. I'm It's Matt Ward on Twitter if you guys want to follow. Coral.io if you're interested in looking at more interesting companies and possibly learning a little bit more. Can't say anything more than that. And if you like this, make sure to subscribe to the channel. You get entered to win a free t-shirt and the syndicate.vc is the podcast I run that's a lot like this, interviewing some of the best minds in crypto business, VC, angel, all that good stuff. Thanks for tuning in, guys. And thanks, Jimmy. And thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Thank Matt. you. Yeah. Cheers. And